What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video and in today's video I have my review for you of season 2 of The Bad Batch. I honestly can't believe that we're already done with season two of The Bad Batch. All these weeks have passed. And before I even get into my thoughts on this season, I want to just say how awesome it is that we were getting The Bad Batch alongside The Mandalorian for the last few weeks. I mean, if you would have told me when I was a kid that we were going to have many shows and movies that were going to continue the Star Wars lore and expand the stories all these years later, I would have absolutely been mind boggled just with that knowledge alone. But to know that I would live in a time where I'm going to have two of these shows airing at the exact same time every week at times with the Bad Batch dropping two episodes at a time alongside an episode of The Mandalorian talk about amazing i also want to go ahead and state really quickly that i do have somebody else in my house who's still sleeping in the room behind me so if it does sound like i'm a little bit more hushed than i usually am that's why i won't be you know whispering but i'm gonna try to not be yelling or speaking too loudly yeah i really enjoyed this season i had a lot of fun with season two of the bad batch big thanks once again to dave filoni and the beautiful people over at lucasfilm for bringing this to us if you guys have seen my reviews for the other animated Star Wars shows, you guys know I love the Clone Wars, I love Star Wars Rebels, I've pretty much loved most of the Star Wars TV shows that have come out, with maybe Resistance being my absolute least favorite of the bunch, but still enjoyable for what it is. Um, the Book of Boba Fett was a little bit messy at times, but still thoroughly enjoyed the show. And so now we have season two of The Bad Batch. I loved the first season. I felt like it was a really natural extension of the Clone Wars, even more so than Rebels, which I consider a sequel series to the Clone Wars. And so to now have season two of The Bad Batch and have it wrapping up, it's just crazy to be this invested in these characters all this time later, to be this invested in the story, and to have something that really is a great follow-up to the Clone Wars as it pretty much takes place right after the Clone Wars, more so than any of the other shows and movies. So yeah, I do wanna say that I'm not gonna get into spoilers initially, but I will give a spoiler warning and I'll get into some spoilers on the latter half of this review. Uh, so I'll definitely give you guys that warning, but I am gonna speak as if you have seen at least the first season of The Bad Batch. I can't imagine you to click on this video if you haven't at least watched any of The Bad Batch. So that's your warning at least for the first season in terms of knowledge. And I'm not gonna get deep into that. I already did a whole video talking about everything about the first season of the bad batch but of course that first season ends with the batch going their separate ways from crosshair as even though they did work together at the end of that last season you know he feels like they betrayed him he feels like they kind of moved on without him and that even though he did take out his inhibitor chip and they thought that he had it in they didn't even try to come and save him as his perspective on it, so he chooses not to continue on with the Bad Batch, even though there's that incredibly touching moment at the end of the season where you have Omega telling him that, you know, they're still brothers and sisters with Omega. And so, yeah, you know, I was really excited to see where this season was going to go, and it opens up in some really fun ways, a lot of that fun Bad Batch Clone Wars action that you come to expect from this season and this series. Uh, there's a lot of great visuals. The animation, once again, is really crisp and clean. It's really amazing for me to have been a kid when the Clone Wars was starting, you know, and go into my teen years watching the various seasons that would come out. And with every season, the animation got better and better. But once we ended up getting that final season of the Clone Wars just a couple of years ago, and now with the Bad Batch, it's been pretty incredible to see them take this same animation style that we've seen from the Clone Wars into the Bad Batch and see it get expanded upon and, and just consistently looking more and more crisp, more and more beautiful, and overall just really loved the way that this season looks. So again, just a big praise to Dave Filoni and all the animators and all the various people that work at Lucasfilm that brought this to life. And of course, you can't talk about the Bad Batch or even the Clone Wars without talking about D. Bradley Baker, the man behind the voice of all the clones, as well as so many other characters across so many different TV shows and movies. He's easily one of the most versatile voice actors working in the game today. And I just loved hearing him play the Bad Batch again. He's just so great as these clones. And what I love about his ability to play 
the same voice is the fact that he's able to bring distinction to all of these voices. All of these clones have individuality and there are elements about them that make them distinct to who they are. And with the Bad Batch, they all are supposed to be genetically modified clones, a little bit different than the rest of them. So they are meant to have different kinds of voices. So they're very easy to differentiate in terms of all the clones. But what I really love about his ability to play all the various clones, including other famous clone characters like uh, Captain Rex or uh, Commander Cody is the ability to differentiate their voices slightly enough so that it gives them that individuality while also allowing us as an audience member to be able to be like wow I can actually tell which clone that is even though it sounds fairly similar to all the other ones. I think Dee Bradley Baker is just consistently proving himself to be one of the best voice actors in the world uh, uh, ever to be completely honest. He's incredibly talented and um, yeah he brings so much heart to this season with the performances he brings to the Bad Batch as well as all the other clones that we see appear here at like Captain Rex or Commander Cody, which was fantastic to see him. I remember when I was at the Star Wars Celebration panel in Anaheim last year for the Bad Batch, uh, you know, they showed the trailer and we saw that uh, Gunji was going to be showing back up and we showed that uh, Commander Cody was going to be showing up again. And it was fantastic to see these characters from the Clone Wars and, you know, Commander Cody, of course, being from the prequel movies, uh, reappearing in this show. I thought that that was really, really well done. And I think that, uh, again, D. Bradley Baker just really brings it. And then, of course, the heart of the show from the first season into this season is Michelle Ang as Omega or Omega. Yeah, I loved Omega in the first season and I love her here as well. And what I really loved about what they did with Omega in this season was the fact that they made her a full-fledged member of the Bad Batch. In the first season, she was a little bit more of a, a kid who needed to be taken care of, but she wanted to be a part of things. She wanted to help. She wanted to be more invested in things. She wanted to put herself on the line. And, you know, Hunter and the rest of the gang didn't really want to have to put her in that place. But right out of the gate from season two, we see that she's become far more proficient with her crossbow. We see that she's become uh, far more proficient as a, a team member um, and actually is an actual effective member of the Bad Batch. While there are moments where they do look at her as a kid and they do try to protect her, and there are moments where they realize that she is a kid this season, they had to lean into that a little bit more where they have to take a step back and recognize that this is a kid. This is somebody who needs, you know, friends and needs other kids to play with you know she shouldn't be raised to just be a soldier like we are but beyond that i really enjoyed the fact that they really trust in her a lot more they gave her far more to do in this season not only on a writing level when it comes to dave filoni and the team but the characters themselves they wanted her to be involved you know they would send her out on missions to do dangerous things and they trusted in those moments that she was going to get those things done and i think that was one of my favorite things about this season is seeing that progression from the Bad Batch with Omega and how she's no longer just this ward, if you will, that needs to be protected. While she is somebody they want to protect, she is somebody that they very much trust and look at as an equal on their team. And I thought that that was without a doubt one of the best parts and Michelle Ang definitely brings it. And I just think that her and Dee Bradley Baker, of course Dee Bradley Baker having to play all the clones, but her really playing off of him with all these various characters, I think that they really are the heart of this show and they're what makes this show work 100%. Of course, we have Rhea Perlman returning as Sid, and we're going to get into the character of Sid in a little bit, but uh, yeah, you know, she was a bit of a, you know, rough, tough, kind of comedic character who was helpful to the Bad Batch in the first season, and in this season, she is incredibly, incredibly irritating. You know, at first, it seems like it's going to be a little bit more of the same with Sid, but yeah, moving into the second season, there were some character choices when it came to Sid that definitely upset a lot of fans, and uh, for the, in a good way, you know, I think that she added an element to the story of drama that you need in a story like this. Uh, but it is frustrating as a viewer when it comes to Sid, and we're gonna get into why in just a little bit. One of the most notable new characters of this season is the character of Fee, played by Wanda Sykes. As soon as I heard her voice, I was like, oh my God, that's Wanda Sykes. I uh, love Wanda Sykes usually in anything, and I never really thought I'd hear her in Star Wars, but I really enjoy the character of Fee. At first, she kind of seemed like a throwaway character in the first couple of episodes that she's introduced in, but over the course of the season, she becomes a far more integral part of the show and a far more integral part of the journey of the Bad Batch. We'll get into her a little bit more but later on, but she reminded me a lot of like an Indiana Jones types character which at times got me a little bit excited at the possibility of seeing Dr. Aphra perhaps on screen. However, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen anytime soon. 
And then the most notable other character to talk about for sure is the character Dr. Hemlock, played by Jimmy Simpson. Yeah, definitely an interesting character here. Really enjoyed the voice and the look and the ambiance of the character. Uh, he's a guy who is in charge, pretty much, of the new era of cloning. And uh, before, I won't talk too much about it here until I get into the spoiler portion of this review, but yeah i really enjoyed the character of hemlock here i really enjoy seeing this kind of sinister doctor character who is his one vision is to try to figure out cloning for palpatine moving forward uh, there's clearly some stuff going on between both uh, the mandalorian and this show to try to set up some ties into the events of the rise of skywalker where of course we see that palpatine returned via a clone we know that snoke was a clone uh the movie never explicitly says that the palpatine that we see in the rise of skywalker is a clone but the rise of skywalker novelization however did confirm that he was a clone so i think that um, this show and uh, the mandalorian are currently working in their own ways to set up the cloning part of things and how the emperor was slowly trying to figure that out for himself which is consistent with the old canon books uh you know now known as legends a lot of people complain that we don't have the old canon as the current canon uh, but they have been pulling from things and uh Palpatine cloning himself was a huge part of the previous canon, so I'm not surprised to see them going in that direction. But overall, I enjoyed the season a lot. I had a lot of fun with it. There are moments that got me emotional, that gave me chills, that made me excited. There are moments with great action and great visuals. But I will be honest, I think, in saying that I think the first season might have had a bit of a tighter narrative overall. Both seasons are filled with some fun episodes that some may call filler. I don't really think that any of them are specifically solely filler. I think they all have some something that they introduce or say or, or have happen that does inflict some sort of cause and effect kind of thing into the next episode or into later episodes in the season so you can't really watch the whole season and skip an episode that maybe is considered filler um, and, and not feel a little bit lost later on you all have to watch it all it all does connect and there are little lines of dialogue and moments that happen in all the episodes that do have a through line uh, but there are a couple episodes in this season i would say that were just far more fun adventures which is you know consistent with what we saw in the first one uh, but i do think that the first season had a little bit more of a streamlined narrative with a little bit more drama at times and i found that the second season had a little bit more of a silly energy at times with a lot more adventure episodes but when it does get serious and when those big plot point episodes do appear it is some of the best Star Wars that we've seen in recent years. I really thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed The Bad Batch Season 2. I've had a lot of fun with it. I'm really looking forward to Season 3. I didn't expect them to end a Season 2 the way that they did, um, but that just made me even more excited for Season 3. So I can't really get too much further into my thoughts on here without talking about spoilers. So that is your spoiler warning. Let's go ahead and get into the rest of the season. We'll talk about it a little bit more in depth. And if there are some things I don't mention here that you guys want to talk about, definitely leave some comments down below and we'll get into that together for sure. So one thing I just definitely wanted to mention is that in the first episode, which was just kind of more of a fun adventure episode to set the series off, uh, it's called Spoils of War. And uh, we get to see the batch actually going to, uh, you know, get some treasure from some location to get some uh, cargo. And uh, it turns out to be Count Dooku's lair pretty much uh, on his home world. And we learn a little bit about, you know, Count Dooku and how he kind of essentially betrayed his home world once he became uh, part of the Separatist and working with Palpatine and different things like that. And so it was nice to kind of have this callback to the prequel era to you know have these connections to the clone wars a little bit more and while you know it's more of just a setting um I, I liked just spending time there so it was nice that the first episode has some ties to count dooku then moving on to the third episode it was called the solitary clone and this was a very blade runner-esque episode that centered primarily on the character of crosshair and i'll just go ahead and continue this on by saying that crosshair without a doubt had the best episodes in the season in my opinion there are definitely fantastic episodes with the whole bad batch but the crosshair specific episodes i found to be the most dramatic the most exciting to watch the most emotional and the ones that i found really tapped into the the darker tone of this show that i enjoy the most i thought that, that was a really great episode to see where crosshair is um, i almost wish that we got more crosshair in this season then we have the fourth episode called faster and they introduce something here called riot racing we end up seeing that tech end up going to a race uh for sid uh essentially in place of the racer that she currently has named teo who's this funny robot droid there that uh you know thinks he's the best racer of all time uh but you know he, he goes based on like an algorithm more so so then, then skill and kind of 
thinking about things properly. And so Tech decides to do this thing called Riot Racing, and it was very similar, clearly, um, to Pod Racing. It was supposed to, I think, in my opinion, uh, be a callback to something like Pod Racing. And so that whole episode is more of a racing episode, but it's also the first episode to really set up the fact that Sid may not be the best friend for the Bad Batch to be hanging around with, as some of her old colleagues, who now no longer really view her all that well, uh, had some pretty notable things to say about her in terms of her maybe stabbing the Bad Batch in the back, which we do start to see over the course of the season. Episode 5, Entombed, which featured the character uh, Fee once again, uh, I thought was a really great episode, very much reminded me of Indiana Jones, and during this episode specifically is where I expected to maybe and hopefully see the character of Dr. Afra. Unfortunately, we didn't see that happen, but uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the episode's feel and vibe. Uh, again, in some ways, just another fun adventure episode, uh, but I really, really enjoyed uh, the visuals, the action, um, and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that Indiana Jones-esque vibe that this season had, which which there was quite a bit of that throughout the course of the season. There's actually a couple of episodes that reference Indiana Jones at times uh, with small little moments, which Indiana Jones themselves have done for Star Wars, uh, most notably with Club Obi-Wan in Temple of Doom. Then episode 6, Tribe, is the one that reintroduces us to Gunji, the character from the Clone Wars, a young Padawan Wookiee that, uh, yeah, you know, we got to see him go uh, to the planet Ilum um, in the Clone Wars and go with all the other Padawans to find their crystals to create their lightsabers um, But of course, you know, we don't really know what happened to most of those younglings after the events of Order 66 Unfortunately, we know what happened to many of them But we also don't know what happened to all of them So when it comes to uh, being able to see a character like Gunji again I remember when I was in the Bad Batch panel at Star Wars Celebration and they showed the trailer for that The whole room went crazy when uh, Gunji did appear in the trailer So of course we knew that he was going to be showing up in the show, but that was an absolute absolute huge fan favorite moment of the trailer during the panel and then uh, to be able to see him in this show once again I thought was great and uh, there's some great fun action when it comes to his character as well. Then we get the Clone Conspiracy and Truth and Consequences which was a two-part episode that dropped uh, where we get to see Senator Chuchi return from the Clone Wars who is now fighting for rights when it comes to the clones. We're of course seeing the transition from the clone troopers into the stormtroopers across the Bad Batch and we're seeing that there are people in the Empire who just want to get rid of the clones. They just want to kind of throw them to the wayside, have them on the side of the streets, which would be consistent with what we saw in things like uh, the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, where we see one of the clone troopers is just sitting there on the side of the street begging. And yeah, you know, there's people in the Empire who just want to throw these clones away. But there are people like Senator Chuchi, as well as Bill Organa, and some others who are trying to, you know, find some way to properly retire the clones without just completely disregarding them after everything that they did for the Republic, which of course we know that the Republic and the Empire unfortunately are one and the same as Palpatine was pulling all the strings. And the most notable part of the end of these two-part episodes is the fact that we have uh, Admiral Rampart coming out in this season from the last season who's you know a player in the earlier part of the season i didn't expect them to take him out in this show the way that they did but he ends up getting blamed by palpatine for the destruction of camino which the empire at the time was selling as a bad storm they were saying that a bad storm destroyed all of camino and all the life forms on camino and all the labs for the cloning on camino and that was what admiral rampart was saying but as soon as it was outed that the empire actually did destroy camino the Emperor appears in this absolutely fantastic and ominous fashion and ends up pretty much telling everybody that Admiral Rampart did this on, of his own accord and ends up turning everybody against Admiral Rampart who is only following orders. Uh, and I just love that Palpatine always has his hands on both sides of, of the war, that he always has his hands everywhere, that he always is puppeteering the entire thing and I think that there's some really great moments here Ian McDiarmid returns to voice the character of Palpatine which was fantastic to hear his voice once again behind that character and uh, yeah that was such a great ominous scene again just really showcasing Palpatine's control the fact that he has a contingency plan for pretty much everything and anything and how even the people that are you know serving him underneath him if they make any sort of step that makes him look bad they're out he's going to find a way to get them out so he ends up utilizing this situation to actually just strengthen everybody's want and need of a new stormtrooper army versus the clones and i thought that was really really great 
Love those two episodes. Definitely the most political episodes of the season and uh, really, really thoroughly enjoyed that. I also want to say the quick shout out that we get to see Senator Pomlo return, which was fantastic. She's from Rogue One, played uh, once again, actually, uh, by Sharon Duncan Brewster, who played her in Rogue One. So it was really great to see a character from Rogue One appear in animated form now. Uh, it's always great when we get to see a character from animated form appear in live action, which in some ways is almost always more epic. But to be able to see a character from the live action stuff appear in animated is always really awesome as well. Then we move on to episode 11, which I really loved, and that was a very alien-inspired episode known as Metamorphosis. And over the course of this episode, you have the Bad Batch coming across a creature that we end up learning is the Zillow Beast, the same kind of beast that we saw run absolutely crazy across Coruscant that all of the Republic troops as well as the Jedi had to work to defeat. They had really, really strong, uh, pretty much impenetrable uh, skin. And yeah, I really, really enjoyed seeing what they did here with this episode because in the Clone Wars, and one of the long time questions that a lot of fans have had is what happened to that Zillow Beast? In the Clone Wars, we see the Palpatine pretty much tells the you know his people that he wants to keep the Zillow Beast around. He wants to find a way to utilize its skin uh, for, for something, you know? And uh, like I said, it has invulnerable, impenetrable skin. And so we never saw what ended up happening with the Zillow Beast, but we see in this episode that the Empire ends up showing up, they end up uh, neutralizing the creature and end up capturing the creature. I think further showing that they're utilizing this creature for maybe cloning or trying to, you know, find a way to replicate its skin, maybe for some sort of armor. And I'm really curious to see where they go with that moving forward. I'm sure a lot of fans like myself have even more questions about that now moving forward. The Outpost episode 12 is another episode I absolutely loved and it was a crosshair centric episode and this is the one where he really realizes that the Empire does not care about the clone troopers. He had this mentality the entire time that good soldiers follow orders and that's why he continued to do what he did but he meets a clone here named Mayday who's just been thrown to the wayside and builds a relationship with Mayday over the course of the episode realizing that the Empire doesn't respect Mayday and the other clones and when Mayday pretty much is right on the verge of death and ends up dying, the Empire doesn't want to do anything. They don't want to waste any resources to help this clone because he's pretty much already dead. And this is the moment where Crosshair really has a turning point in his mind and realizes that the Empire does not value him, does not value the clones, and that he's on the wrong side of the war. But it's a little bit too late because after he decides to um, kill his officer above him, yeah, he ends up getting captured and taken to Dr. Hemlock's lair. And that brings us into the last few episodes, episode 14 through 16. We see that Crosshair has been captured. He's being uh, tested on. He's had all these experiments going on with Dr. Hemlock. He's trying to, you know, control and trying to manipulate Crosshair. In the meantime, we know that Dr. Hemlock is trying to get his hands on Omega because he has Nala Say, um, you know, one of the Kaminoan researchers and one of the scientists. And uh, he wants to use Omega to essentially force Nalase to work with him on how they clone people, how they clone things in general, and use their technology to help clone Palpatine moving forward, which they never specifically say that they want to clone Palpatine, but they know that it's for the Emperor's deeds, which we already know what that is. Um, but yeah, these last few episodes I thought were really, really great. I found myself really emotionally invested in everything going on with Crosshair. Again, Dr. Hemlock, very ominous villain, really thoroughly enjoyed um, his spirit and his vibe throughout the course of the film. He's driven. He doesn't care what anybody has to say and it's not like a character we've never seen in star wars before but i thought that the voice and the ominous nature of his character and the atmosphere he brought to the scenes i thought was really really creepy really cool i really enjoyed the character i thought the voice behind him was awesome too and um, yeah overall just really enjoyed all the stuff going on on mount tantis and i also really quickly just want to shout out the fact that commander krennic that we end up seeing in rogue one actually makes an appearance in animation as well he only has one quick line of dialogue but it's pretty awesome to see and the season ends up wrapping up with omega being captured she's captured and she's now on mount tantis nala say finally gets to see omega again but she's pretty much being forced into doing this cloning for the empire in the meantime crosshair is unconscious when omega finds him of course we know that he's been you know given different medications and different things like that to keep him sedated and Probably the most notable and heartbreaking part of this finale was the possible death of Tech. Uh, I almost want to say that that's not true. I expect that when we get into Season 3 that we will see uh, Tech is actually alive, perhaps captured as well on Mount Tantus. Uh, we do see that Dr. Hemlock had his goggles. He was able to recover the goggles. So that kind of gave me hope that Tech is indeed alive. But 
that scene where you believe Tech is dead and just Omega's reaction and the Bad Batch's reaction afterwards is just gut-wrenching. I honestly can't wait for them to get back to Pabu. I didn't talk about Pabu in this episode, but it was kind of like a safe space that they went to in this season um, with Fee. And uh, Fee and Tech were building a bit of a relationship, it seemed. And um, I am really curious to see when they go back to Pabu and uh, tell Fee what ended up happening. I really, 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 really want to hope that Tech is not dead. I feel like just story progression-wise, knowing Dave Filoni, there's no way in hell that he actually killed off Tech. But if he did, it was impactful, it was emotional, and I think it is really going to drive the Bad Batch moving forward. And then, you know, I thought this season was going to end with them saving Crosshair and kind of having a happy-go-lucky finale. But it wasn't. It wasn't a happy-go-lucky finale. Tech is dead, apparently. You have Crosshair who's still unconscious and is at the, the mercy of Dr. Hemlock. You have Omega now being captured by Dr. Hemlock and the Empire. They're there stuck at Mount Tantis. You have the cloning procedure starting to move forward in terms of Palpatine and the Bad Batch don't even know where Omega is. They don't know where Mount Tantus is. They don't know what planet Dr. Hemlock took them to. And so they're kind of at a loss. They're just kind of sitting there depressed, sad. They're beaten up. They're bruised and they don't know what direction to go. But then the season ends in probably one of the most insane ways that I did not expect it was going to end. Dr. Scalder, who's a character I haven't even mentioned here, who was working alongside Dr. Hemlock this entire season, she was just seemed like his assistant the entire time, she ends up revealing to Omega that she is actually Omega's sister, takes her goggles off, and it almost looked like she kind of looked like Tech a little bit, to be completely honest, but yeah, it turns out that she seems to be another clone, another female clone, that's so why now it seems like we may have two female clones in the series maybe even more with omega and now dr scalder so i did not expect that at all that's how the season ends as soon as she says that she's omega's sister the credits roll and i just was looking at the screen like wow i couldn't believe that they ended the season in on such a really dire and dramatic way you know the characters are in a really bad place and it really sets up season three to be a far more stake driven story i am very curious to see what season three is i'm curious to see how many seasons of this will get uh, you know star wars tends to have pretty tight seasons for the most part the clone wars ran on a lot longer i think because of the era of time that that show came out in but rebels is a tight four seasons resistance is two seasons and or that's only going to be two seasons uh, of course we don't know about the mandalorian and some other shows but i am curious to see how long the bad batch will go on for will season three be the final season will we get a fourth season as well what Whatever the case may be, I definitely want to hear what you guys have to say. And as I mentioned before, Sid was kind of starting to show us some negative things earlier in the season, some worrisome things about who she is, her character. And it turns out that she actually is the reason that Omega ends up getting captured, as well as the rest of the Bad Batch pretty much for a moment, uh, because of the fact that uh, she actually is the one who contacted uh, Dr. Hemlock and contacted the Empire as to their location and gave them up. Fuck Sid. Obviously, I've been talking a little bit more hush here, so hopefully you guys did not uh, hate that throughout the course of this video. But yeah, there's so many little things that I didn't mention in this season, of course. It would take me way longer to go ahead and go through every little detail. But I loved this season. I loved the show. I had a blast with it, and I hope you guys did as well. Definitely can't wait to hear what people have to say about this show, about this season. What was your favorite episode? What were your favorite moments? And what did you guys think about the finale? Leave any and all comments down below, and I'll see you beautiful people in the next one. May the Force be with you. Bye-bye.